everyone. Good evening. Mm -hmm. Tracy coming to you live from New Hampshire Dog Walking Club headquarters. And I am here tonight with my first guest, who is Laura Gendron of Misbehavior Training. I have a feeling you know her well. She is one of our expert partners, and she has been an avid supporter of the club for many years. And today we have a very special reason for coming to you live. We have five stories that we're going to be sharing to, with you about reactive dogs. And I know that this is something you can probably relate to. The majority of us have reactive dogs based on the survey feedback we have received from members. And there's also been a lot of concerns that have been expressed in regards to, are these walks okay for me? Is the club a good investment for me? What kind of things will I benefit from? How will this help my dog and help me? And so I got together five of our official club members to bring their stories of success um, and, you know, setbacks as well. It's, it's not an easy journey that everybody has been on, but it has been a rewarding journey is what I've been hearing. And so we're going to start out our broadcast tonight with Laura Gender of Misbehavior Training, as I mentioned, because she is a trainer, certified trainer, and she also is the mom of a reactive dog. So she's going to talk to us a little bit about that as well. So I'm just going to share with you a presentation that I've put together here. And actually, too, before we get started, Laura, can you just tell us a little bit about misbehavior training and the great work you do there? Yeah, sure. So um, my name is Laura Gendron, misbehavior. I am the owner and founder of it, and I started in 2008. So it's been a while. <laughs> um, every time I think back on that, I have to do the math. But um, so I primarily work with reactive dogs, especially dogs who are a little bit more on the fearful side. Um, which, you know, without getting into all that, that's where a lot of reactivity can come from. And we'll talk a little bit about that on the next slide, I think. <laughs> and um, I have a really, I have a soft spot for them just because of my history working in, I started off in shelters, um, humane societies, rescues, stuff like that. And I work a lot with Mary's dogs right now. Um, and we see a lot of, you know, fear issues as they come up with rescues and such. So um, that is sort of what I primarily focus on. I do a lot of virtual training with people. I do private training, in-home training, which got, you know, quiet through COVID, but it's starting to pick back up. And it certainly is busy enough for all of us trainers who are, you know, uh, partners with the club to be staying busy because it's been crazy out there. And reactivity is definitely something that we are seeing a lot of. So, um, so that's primarily what I do and why I do it. <laughs> awesome. Well, why don't we jump right into it? Let's mm -hmm. define for people exactly what reactive behavior is so that they have a sense of if this applies to their dog. Sure. Um, so as with this definition, so reactivity is commonly confused with aggression, which is Oh, so very true. It's one of the number one things I hear. Um, dogs that are reactive, they overreact to certain stimuli or situations, genetics, lack of socialization, insufficient training to learn self-control, um, a frightening experience that they've been through, or a combination of any of those can cause reactivity. And fear is typically the driving force, like I was saying. So in my mind, when I think of a reactive dog, it's a dog with really big emotions you know, who just has a really big emotional response to things. But the hard part about it is that that emotional response can look like what people imagine as um, aggression. But also, in my mind, it can look like the dog who is just sort of explosive in excitement, too. So that is also considered, from my perspective, to be a reactive dog because it's, a, it's all emotional. It's either one end of the spectrum or the other, but typically that hyperactivity is can also be stemmed in fear also, or also. So, um, well, so, with the stories we have coming up tonight, what's yeah. interesting is all of them touch upon some different version of reactive behavior. So I'm glad yes. that you mentioned that. Yes. Yeah. I see. I definitely see all types. Um, and I think there's a lot of labeling out there, which has its place for sure but also it can get a little bit dangerous because we kind of get stuck on like if if we've known one dog in our past who was reactive which for people now i mean i'm sure if you think you know a lot of dogs who are reactive um but if we've known one dog who had a bite history or something like that and we think about aggression and then we if we pair reactivity with aggression we really can get ourselves into trouble that way so we want to be just really careful about labeling um because reactivity again it's just an emotion uh, 
an emotional response to something, but it's just, it's like the really big emotions. It's the emotions that are really hard for the dogs to um, control internally. And if you're listening to us live or on the replay and you have questions or you have, you know, a story you want to tell us about your reactive dog, please feel free to share. That's what this is all about. Uh, you know, we are a huge proponent of having reactive dogs join our social outings. But I think it's important for people to realize if your dog would be comfortable in this situation and if they're ready. And that's one of the things Laura is going to explain to us how to know if they're ready as well. Yes. So um, when, so there's, I don't want to put like reactivity on the spectrum, but it kind of is, there's, there's, you can kind of think of it as like, there's the really fear reactive shut down dog on one end. And then there's the really outgoing, overly excited dog on the other end. And most dogs fall somewhere in between that. So um, there are dogs who are, you know, obviously reactive around people or towards people. So they're more people shy um, or more people reactive, fearful. There are dogs who are more reactive to other dogs. And then dogs who are more reactive to like squirrels and chipmunks and cats and chickens and all that stuff. And then, you know, there are dogs who are just reactive to anything new in the environment. And then there's the dog that's reactive to any combination of those things because they're just overwhelmed with so many things going on in their life. So um, as far as the walks go, I've definitely found or seen that and referred for some of my clients, the people who, who have dogs who are maybe dog reactive or people reactive, um, and they've been, they've worked on some of the skills that they need, like they've worked on, I mean, a lot of what I teach is just working on how to change their emotional response to things. Um, so They've worked on some of that stuff at home and they have maybe started to get out and about in a quiet area to start with. And then now they're kind of like, okay, well now how do I do that in between thing? <laughs> how do I do the thing where like I'm out and about by myself and I'm kind of keeping to myself, but I want to start to just get my dog used to being around other dogs, other people at a distance, but I can't control if a loose dog comes running up to me or I can't, um, I don't know where to go because I don't know, you know, what the environment's going to be like or, you know, how much space there's going to be there. Um, I don't know, you know, if it's a really noisy place, stuff like that. Those are definitely things that a lot of my clients have run into is just not knowing um, what to expect from the situation. So I think those are the clients and those are the people and the dogs who are probably a lot closer to being ready for this type of situation. Um if you have a dog, though, who is just really overwhelmed by, you know, too much happening at once, is really overwhelmed by um, even things such as just like uh, wind, you know, some dogs are really just sensitive to wind. We can't control the wind that we're going to have in a certain place. Um, some dogs, I, you know, are really sensitive. I went on a, a retreat with some of the other experts in the group uh, what, two weekends ago now, and there were a couple dogs there who were really shy about the camera and about having pictures taken of them. Um, so those are like little things to consider in knowing whether your dog is ready for a group outing where you, you don't really necessarily know how many people are going to be there, but you are going to know how much space you have and what the environment's like, because I know you, Tracy, do your homework <laughs> and you go ahead of time and you check out all these places, which is yeah. super helpful for me. Um, and I'm sure that it's going to be really helpful for everybody else too. So I think, I think if you have a dog who has, has those skills at home and has worked on that and you've got some of that going and then you're ready to introduce them to a group like environment, even if you don't go for the walk and you just kind of come for like the first 15 minutes and just, you know, check it out with your dog and see how your dog does. I think that's a great place to start. Yeah. Okay. That those are all great info, uh, great tips and great information. And I like what you mentioned about homework because in regards to looking at the specific venues, um, I also talk with our partners, whether it's veterinarians, dog trainers, canine fitness experts, whomever, um, to make sure that the close proximity or the type of venue or the type of event um, is right for dogs. And a lot of times you'll see that we do limit attendance at our events. It's usually between 30 and 40 at our larger special events, specifically for comfort reasons, because we don't want to have an event where we have to exclude a certain temperament of dog. 
Mm -hmm. um, we've had, you know, our successful Easter egg hunt. We have our corn maze uh, and Halloween party coming up and we'll have reactive dogs at those events and they'll have just as great a time as non-reactive dogs. So yes. I appreciate you saying that. Yeah. So Laura, I know you have a reactive dog that, mm -hmm. that, you know, big time reactive dog that's hanging out there being all yeah. uh, lovey and stuff. So yeah. tell us a little bit about your story with Willow. So, um, yep. So that's my Willow and she's over there tearing up a toy. <laughs> um, <laughs> she is four years old. I got her when she was about eight months old, um, from a rescue in Northwood, not Mary's dogs. It was another rescue. And she was a foster um, failure, although I think she was a foster win. I wish they would change some of that terminology because um, they're not failing. Um, so she was, when she came to me, I had two other dogs in the house um, and she was just getting into her adolescence. I remember the first time I actually met her, the first thing she did was jump on my, then I think he was four year old, my son who was four years old and just knock him right down. And I'm like, Oh my goodness, what am I getting myself into just fostering this dog? <laughs> but then I took her, I actually took her to the dog park at a time when it was totally empty and let her run and get some of her crazies out. And she actually, I mean, that alone made a massive difference for her. And then we had some decompression time at home um, and she just got to chill out. But then as time went on, um, I had, like I said, two other dogs. One of my dogs, Felix, was, um, I think he was about 11 at the time. And he was one dog who would kind of bring on all the bully dogs. Like he just had this way about him. It was a little socially awkward, if I could call him that. Um, he just didn't quite know how to be social around other dogs. Well, Willow, I mean, until I signed the adoption papers, she was a perfect little angel. She she got along with everybody just great. <laughs> so that was the case. <laughs> yes. As soon as I signed the adoption papers, I remember even I went to Home Depot with her and I had to just get a gate for her. And she went through Home Depot and she's barking at everybody and everything. Oh, no. And I'm like, oh my goodness, <laughs> I'm not a dog trainer. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> but I was in such a hurry that day. So we were just in and out and it was fine. And we actually haven't been back to Home Depot since. That's um that's one of my goals with her. <laughs> but um, but anyway, so I had this older dog, Felix, and then I had a uh, younger dog, uh, slightly younger. She was, I think, eight at the time, Cora. Well, Felix was that awkward dog. And all of a sudden, Willow started picking on him, picking on him. And by picking on him, what she would do is she would just like kind of come out of nowhere and she would just like muzzle punch him. So he, he could be laying down facing the wall, like doing nothing. And she would just kind of see him and then go running over to him and just go after him, but not, not fighting, just kind of like punch him with her muzzle. So that's what I mean by muzzle punching. And... Um, it was just odd to me. It was, you know, I've been in the, I've been training for a long time up until that point. And um, it was just, it was a weird presentation. Turns out like less than a month later, I noticed he was losing a lot of weight and all that. And it turned out that he actually had um, a tumor in next to his heart, but it wasn't pressing on his heart yet. Guess where she kept muzzle punching him. Oh my was goodness. right in that spot. Well, that's my, that's the wrong side of my body, but right in that spot, right next to where that tumor was. This is a really common thing that can happen with dogs is if they all of a sudden are picking on older dogs and it just doesn't seem quite right. I always have the older dogs get a vet check uh, just to see, but I didn't follow my own advice at that point until I noticed that he started losing weight and then come to find out he had that tumor um, and he ended up, I ended up having to put him to sleep um, maybe not even two months later. Oh, wow. And after that, the dynamics in the household changed quite a bit between my two females. Um, and they started getting into it just nonstop. I mean, it was it was predictable, but it was unpredictable at the same time. And I had two kids or I have I still have my two kids. <laughs> <laughs> I, <hope so. laughs> I have two kids. They were probably like five and seven at the time um, when all that started happening. And um, so I ended up having to just keep Cora and Willow separate all the time. Cause they were, and when I talk dog bites, I mean, they were dog bites. Neither one of them wanted to give in to it. So, I mean, they had to be pulled apart. Um, so they were pretty serious. And when you have kids in the house, that can be pretty dangerous pretty quickly. So they were just completely separated. Um, I basket muzzle trained her immediately, both dogs. I basket muzzle trained both dogs. Um, and my sister-in-law actually loved Cora. And she en ended up taking her um, maybe about two years ago now. And she's like living her best life over there. So we're no longer living behind fences and gates. 
But ever since then, to be perfectly honest, I've had a little PTSD from that because of what I witnessed and how awful it was. Um, so now Willow's, I mean, she's done much better in the last year, but her biggest thing became um, offense is my best line of defense. Because she wasn't picking on Cora. Cora actually started off picking on her. And then she started defending herself. So now my biggest fear with her is if a loose dog were to come running up to her, if we're out and about somewhere, what is she going to do? You know, and how far is she going to take it? And as we all know, um, as much as we say, please leash your dog, when there are loose dogs out there, some people don't leash their dogs, even though they don't have control over them, voice control over them, and even if there is leash laws. So um, so needless to say, this basket muzzle, which is a little hard to see, but this basket muzzle is our best friend. <laughs> um, and Willow, as you can see from the pictures, she kind of, she gained her freedom because she got used to wearing a basket muzzle because she got accustomed to a basket muzzle. So mm -hmm. I had made a post a long time ago um, about that because it really kind of hit me that like when she started wearing that basket muzzle and when I started feeling comfortable enough to take her out in that basket muzzle, that's when she got her freedom back. So a lot of people have this, this idea about basket muzzles, you know, looking like it looks like Cannibal Lecter, looks so cruel, looks awful, you know, they must be miserable. I mean, the dog in the pictures here, she is far from miserable. Um, and she loves to come out and about with me. I just, I don't have the confidence to know that I can trust her response if another, if a loose dog were to come running over to us um, or a loose kid for that matter. <laughs> like yep. She's great with my kids, but I haven't had her around all that many other kids. Um, and you know, kids can run amok the same way dogs can run amok. So, um, so just having that gives us another little barrier of protection. And it gives me the confidence of knowing that if a poor choice were made by other owners, other dogs, kids, um, or if I, I slipped up and gave her a little bit too much freedom um, or too much leash, then I would have that barrier of protection. So it gives me confidence. But the other great thing about it is it, it, it's a pretty, pretty standard that people see a muzzle or a muzzle dog and they're like, oh, I'm just going to give that dog a little bit of extra space, even though technically that dog is now safer. Yeah. Um, and there are many reasons why a dog might be wearing a muzzle. They might just eat the, all the mushrooms on their walk. And, you know, we want to have a muzzle on for safety for that reason. Right. So there are lots of reasons, but it's kind of the universal signal to people to give that dog extra space. So if for nothing else, I love it for that reason. And she can pant in it. She can, I definitely give her lots and lots of treats in there so she can eat treats easily. She can drink water out of there. Um, you know, she can actually eat food right off the ground if she really wanted to. Um, but I usually help her out. And as you can see, I was comfortable enough to be as close as I was to all those other dogs um, who were on leash and, you know, under control and all that. But you never know when you can, when something unexpected comes up. So. Well, and I know prior to this walk, which was your first with the club, you've been on walks as an expert uh, member and a featured expert. Yes. But yep. this was your first one bringing Willow. And you and I had a conversation beforehand, just kind of talking it out. And, you know, you were a little nervous. I wasn't yep. sure if you were going to come or not. And I was very excited when you did, because yep. I was anxious to see, too, how Willow was going to uh, do on this walk, just because of your, your past hesitations. Um, I thought she did fantastic. I know everybody else on the walks thought she did fantastic. Unfortunately, I couldn't find the picture of yep. her rolling on her back without her muzzle on yep. because she didn't need it. She was, she was fine. She was, I know she was giving you the signals that she was comfortable in the space, which was fantastic. But also what I want to mention, because, you know, there's a lot of talk between you and the other partners um, that support the New Hampshire Dog Walking Club in regards to basket muzzle training your dog. And one of the, um, video series that Laura and I will be working on together for the pause curriculum, which we'll be launching at the end of the year is how to basket muzzle train your dog. What types of basket muzzles are there? What's the best equipment for your dog? Mm -hmm. um, so there will be a lot of education coming uh, about that with uh, Laura as we get here into uh, the end of the year. Yes. And you know what, Tracy, my favorite, my favorite part of that walk um, was we were on our way up um, up the mountain or the hill. And um, there were some other dogs that were coming down the path and they kind of had to like go through our group because we had pulled over to, you know, give them all drinks of water and a break. 
And so they were going through and I was able to get off to the side and that was all good. But um, the first thing you said to them what, as they were coming was, oh, we have some reactive dogs here. If you don't mind just giving them some extra space. So to be totally honest, just even having that, having you there to sort of like be the buffer and to advocate for the reactive dogs and just like, you know, step right up there and let the people know that, you know, these dogs need extra space was just like unbelievably helpful. Um, sometimes when I am just walking Willow, I'll bring actually Louise has come with me many times of Red Pointy Dog Training. Um, she's come with me and she, she'll get right up there too. And she'll just like help me scope things out. So it's just really nice to have somebody there who can sort of advocate for you and your dog, because when you're walking a reactive dog, it's very stressful. <laughs> um, and so knowing that you're, you're not alone and that like, if something were to happen, you have somebody else there with you and I could kind of hide within that group. So it wasn't like that, that dog that was coming only saw my dog. It's like they saw my dog, but they saw all these other dogs. So they weren't drawn as much to my dog. So that's one thing that I do love about walking in a group setting like that too. Yeah. And I, I have to agree with that. I hear that from uh, many members, the, the advocation that happens when there are either loose dogs or other people coming just to make sure everybody's safe and comfortable, because there's just still a lot of education that needs to happen in regards to dogs being on leash, off leash, recall dogs, reactive dogs. I mean, you and I could go on about this probably all day. Oh, yeah. <laughs> conversation. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so that's one thing that Ray and I do when we're leading our walks. That's our, our event guides are trained to do the, scent, uh, the same thing. And on this walk, interestingly, I was walking my own reactive dog. Mm -hmm. um, I tend to bring her on the pack adventures because we don't have as many people who come out for the weekday walks. Um, so it was an interesting adventure for all yep. of the reactive dogs on that day. <laughs> yep. Well, thank you so much, Laura, for sharing your story. I really appreciate it. Um, uh, you, you've just, you've been a fantastic partner. I'm just so glad to have learned and grown with you over these years and, uh, you know, to be able to give back in that way for you and Willow so that you guys can feel comfortable joining our walks means a lot to me as well. Yes, you're very welcome. And thank you for putting all this together because it's been like the best resource for my clients and for me and, and all that good stuff. So there's just so much I hear nonstop about like, Oh, there's all this fun stuff now to do in the community with our dogs. So, because before reactive or not, absolutely and reactive or not. Prior to this, it was hard to find stuff to be able to do in a group that has some education on uh, behind them too. So. Exactly. Well, thank, thank you, you. ma'am. I know you're probably going to be signing off. I'm going to bring Michelle in with us yes, now so to enjoy my us. dinner. <laughs> Bye, guys. Bye, Laura. Take care. So Michelle has been with the club. Michelle, do you remember? You joined quite a while ago. Do you remember how long you've been with us? I am a founding member. That's right. So yes. you've been with us since we uh, launched the founding member in March, founding membership in March. So you, I know you were with us prior to that, though, too. You and your beautiful dog, Brutus, here with this big smile on his face, um, actually joined some of our uh, very early on walks uh, before we shut down for a few months for covid Yes. Um, Brutus was on and it was actually a very large walk that he was on. It was attended by, was that the one with red pointy dog training? It was. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's probably what brought me, um, or made me may, maybe feel a little more at ease was because Jake and Louise were going to be there and I knew, you know, their experience, it was certainly, um, anxiety ridden for me, but, um, once we got in the pack, he did amazing. I mean, we were in the middle, we started off at the back, we were at the middle, we were near the beginning and, I mean, we had dogs, you know, next to us and right on top of us. And he was just like, OK, we're just kind of trotting along here. <laughs> well, Michelle, tell me a little bit about his reactive behavior. What what does he um, you know, what does he go through? What kind of things does he experience? What's his uncomfortable level with his behavior? Yeah. So I guess fortunately or unfortunately, we learned out very early when we got him that he was um, fear reactive or, or that's what you know, what what we're thinking it is. Um, we, he was rescued from Texas with a couple of his siblings and um, he was quickly moved from Texas to Maine. And within a couple of days we had him here. We signed him up for manners class and he graduated the first class and we went to the second level. We were doing meet and greets and he had met a couple people. They gave him a treat. He was fine. And then I felt so bad for, for this young um, young-ish teenage boy who came over to say hello and 
Brutus just was like, oop, I think you're in my space too much. So he barked and he lunged and he was like, nope, you're too close. Uh, and I was like, oh, yeah, we can't have this. So yeah. the trainer and I tried to work together to, to see what was going on. When we met separately, he did the same thing to her. And um, I was like, okay, uh, we have a seasonal campsite. We spend a lot of time there with a lot of people. And I said, you, we got to fix this really quickly. So um, it's everything. It's people. It's dogs. Um, he is very sensitive. I think that's a really good word. Um, you know, there's some awful scary columns and things out there, you know, when you're going for a walk and you can tell he's fearful, the ears go down, his head goes down. He's not really sure of it. And, um, he doesn't react in that way, but definitely, um, with people and, um, other dogs, if they're a little too close, it's a little too much for him. So, uh, I'm very cautious on where we are. You have to always have to have your head in a swivel. Yeah, and that's what I find, too, It's just having people understand that uh, reactive dogs do need a certain amount of space, uh, you know, be courteous and ask before approaching that dog, hence the whole yellow ri uh, ribbon project that we try to promote at all of our events, uh, bandanas, ribbons, um, a lot of the dogs that walk with us have little labels on their leashes, it might say, I need extra space, I'm anxious, I'm nervous. Um, there's all different kinds. So now I know too, um, Michelle, that you haven't taken Brutus on a walk since COVID, but I know that you've gotten involved with other events because we've got you here um, doing the Doggy Olympics with us. What has been your experience with these uh, kind of specific events? He's done amazing. Um, so we were doing so much work with him. I was out at Home Depot. We were going to Lowe's. Like we were doing a lot of training, getting him out in, in public and around people. And we actually have a harness on him that says in training um, because we wanted to avoid those people running up to him. And it's it's helped a lot. And I have a lot of people ask me, oh, what's he training for? And I'm like, no, 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 that's for you. That's I know. Cool. I love that. I was hoping you were going to say that. <laughs> um, so after COVID, I mean, I was still going out pretty much every day with him going for a walk, but obviously it was quiet. Um, spaces. And I was very nervous about getting him out amongst people and, and wasn't quite sure how to do that. I know Laura was wonderful because in one of your talks, I had said, you know, I'm really anxious about this. I'm not sure what to do. And she said exactly what she said here, just, just take him to a walk and just kind of hang back and see what happens. And I think that's a great idea. But I ended up using Ruby, who's enjoying every single minute of it, um, to be able to go out and check out some of these trails, because I really do like to go out with Brutus a lot and do some hiking and walking. And at least I know what we're in for. Is it busy? How big is the trail? I know at one point I went to Knight, Knight's Pond with him. I'd never been there before. I heard great things about it. And I should have gone beforehand because little did I realize the path was so narrow, I could barely walk with my own two feet. Hmm. Never mind have him next to me. Like it, it was impossible. He either had to be behind me or in front of me. And thankfully, uh, Brutus's muzzle trains and I had it with me. So I was able to put that on because if someone popped around the corner at some point, it would have scared the daylights out of both of us. Sure. Um, but I know you had mentioned that, you know, reactive dogs would be able to participate in the doggy Olympics. And of course, that's something I really wanted to try with him. And I thought, we'll go for it. And I know you've mentioned it once before, and, and I mentioned it that when I signed up for every single event I signed up for, I had a little note. I have a reactive dog. I will assess the situation. And if we have to leave, I will leave um, because I was so anxious about, you know, what he was going to do. And he was amazing. I mean, he went through every single event with barely any issues. He had one little outburst at um, Laura's event, the doggy games. But other than that, uh, I was more anxious and more freaked out than he was. The worst event for me was the mall. Um, okay. I know, you know, I had taken Fenway to the mall with the dog club and he had a ball, but it was closed. But when I pulled into that parking lot and saw all the cars, I thought, oh my God, what, what did I do? What, what did I sign up for? And having spoken to a gentleman outside who had a dog in his car and they went in the mall and the dog was off leash, gave me even more anxiety and so I was, I was already stressing out going in there and he, and he did really well. Um, and thankfully he was doing the sensory experience and he didn't have a care in the world that people were stopping and looking at him. And when we left there, I got in the truck and I sobbed for about 10 minutes. Oh my goodness. I, I was so proud of him for yeah. doing an amazing, amazing thing. And it stressed me out so bad that it just, it burst. Um, I probably will not do something like that again. 
<laughs> we did it, and, and I'm, I'm proud to say that. But um, and you know, connecting with some of these other trainers, I've tapped into a lot of the trainers already. You know, Laura has been a great resource for me. Red Pointy Dog, Megan. I mean, all of them have been there. Um, I have had conversations with, I think it's Ashley from your, yep, you and your dog training and services. Yep. And then um, just hooking up with Monica and April has been amazing. Um, my first experience with Monica was the trifecta that you did at Canine Chaos. Yep. And I had Ruby and somehow her and I got in a conversation about Brutus and she said, I really think that you two, you both would do well in, in my setting. And I was like, all right, we'll try it. And, um, it was incredible. Um, I, I, but of course, you know, the helicopter parent, I'm like, well, where are you going to be? And where does it happen? And what's going on? And, how, and I have a thousand questions and she's like, we'll figure it out. It's okay. She's like, yeah. I can go in the other room. I can hide. So we got there and she said, I'm just going to go sit behind this fence. And I was like, okay. And we went in and it was this metal fence. Like we have in our yard, like wire. And I was like, do you really think that's going to keep him from um, getting through there? I'm thinking this. I didn't say it out loud. <laughs> and he was great. Uh, he walked up and looked at her a couple of times and he didn't have a reaction. But she says to me, OK, take off all his bling. Now, mind you, we go in. He's got his harness and he has his collar and I have a, a pinch collar on. And then he's got, you know, his um, double um, his his leash is attached twice because I had the misfortune of having a collar and I was standing there with the collar and the leash as he went after this woman and two dogs. And it was the most horrifying thing. So I double leashed him and I was like, no, 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 not everything. And she said, yep, everything, even the, the his collar. I was like, but I don't have control over him. And he, she said, you'll be fine. We'll be fine. And I was in awe and it was amazing to watch him go through the room uh, the first few times he was like, Oh, I don't know what that is. I'm no, I'm not going to go over in that corner. Oh my God, that's scary. And by the end he was drinking out of the water front fountain. He was going in between the, the tent and the wall. And each time we go, he now drags me into the room. He's like, Woohoo! <laughs> this is my outing. I'm so excited. <laughs> yes. Yep. And then even working with April, uh, we, we've took the confidence builder and I have definitely seen a change in him as we've been out walking. Cause again, you know, walking by a scary, uh, column is, is, um, tough and the way he and I have both handled it and, and our communication together has improved. And I am just so grateful for, you know, everything you do and, you know, everything these trainers know and do and the support that, that they provide us all. Well, and I appreciate you mentioning that. And I know all of the people that you mentioned are partners with the Dog Walking Club because we are very, very fortunate to have dog trainers and canine fitness experts and veterinarians and nutrition experts. Um, we've got such a great lineup of experts that help us and help our members to answer the questions they need, to feel comfortable with their dogs in social outings and to get, you know, everybody the education that they they want and they deserve. So um, I love that story. And uh, Brutus, I, you know, I've never met him in person. I've seen the pictures of you doing the sensory explorers with Monica and I, I love his engagement with it. I mean, my dog is reactive too, as you know, Dakota, yeah. and she loves sensory explorers as well. It's just, it's like a free time for her to do something that she loves. And, and she is so treat motivated and so scent driven that this is her favorite activity. Um, she is going to be doing the senior fitness with uh, April as well. But even, you know, it's funny because my dog and, and my skills and understanding my dog have grown through the relationships with the partners and with all of the members as well, that I'm now getting Dakota out into different situations. You know, usually she'll be at home at the big walks because I, I just don't know how she'll react and how great would that be for me to be out there with my reactive dog reacting <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm trying to educate people about their reactive dogs. So yeah, um, I appreciate, I appreciate your story and I hope we'll see Brutus at a, at a upcoming walk in the future. Yeah. I look forward to taking him. I definitely feel more comfortable after, you know, the, the Olympics and then um, the class we just took last week with April, there was actually, we, we've been by ourselves, believe it or not. So, yeah. you know, we've had her undivided attention and last week we shared the space with uh, another dog and um there was a little excitement by both of them um, for a little bit, but we each had our own space and we're doing our own things. And I love that, you know, April just said, okay, here you go. She put up some posters for me. She said, you've, you've been through this, you know, the basics. She said, just try and figure it out. So not only was it challenging for Brutus, 
I was exhausted because it was challenging for me. Like I had to go, what am I supposed to do? And how am I supposed to communicate this with him? And he's looking at me like, I don't know what you're talking about. And it was, it was a, a great experience. And, and I appreciate, you know, all of the, the trainers for, for helping with that sensitivity and, um, you know, knowing that, okay, well, this person has to come in first or, you know, we have to go out last or, or whatever it is. And they're all so patient and, um, yeah, they're pretty amazing. Yeah. Pretty yep. awesome. Yep. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Michelle, for sharing your story. I really appreciate it. Um, great information. And uh, I know you also have Ruby and Fenway, who we didn't give any airtime to, but they are also wonderful dogs who do great at the events that they attend. And yeah. I know at some point Ruby will let me touch her. I'm building up her trust in me. So <laughs> she will. she's doing really well. She's, she's, she's doing fantastic. grown since, since we joined the club. And, and that was another reason I joined as well, because, you know, she is, skittish and a little fearful but um not reactive in any way so it's definitely been good for her i agree and you've got um some fans out there as well lisa says brutus has a great loving and committed mommy he's a very lucky boy oh, thank and you. i will echo those sentiments as well lisa thanks for mentioning that thank you all right thank michelle are you staying on with uh tracy as she joins us for her story or are you signing uh, off hey oh no i want to listen to them all because all right. i some of them I know and or or you know had thoughts, but like some of them I'm like, what reactive? You're kidding me. So I'm curious to see what's going on. All right. Well, let's bring Tracy in. How are you, Tracy? Hi, Tracy. Hi, I'm good. How are you? How are you? I'm doing all right. And Tracy is the mom of Echo, who you see here in pictures. And Tracy's story is different from all of the other ones as well, because she has a reactive dog who is extremely friendly with people. Oh my God, this dog will be your best friend. I love this dog. So Tracy, tell us a little bit about Echo's reactive behavior and what makes you nervous when you're out in a social setting. Um, well, Echo, uh, I, I got Echo when he was uh, two and a half to three months old. So he wasn't a rescue. He grew up in a house with other dogs and children and, um, his reactivity, he's three three years old now, and his reactivity started um, just before or around two. Um, and um, it just is all of a sudden he lunged and barked at a truck passing me. And I didn't know what was happening. I had never seen that behavior from him. And um, a lot of things changed in his life at that time. He got neutered. I had family members that move out of the house, COVID hit, um, my work situation changed, my dog walking walker situation, everything changed. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure what to attribute it to, but um, it wasn't until um, the walk at Doors Pond with you guys when Laura was there that I learned that word reactivity. So, um, and, it, and it was nice to know what it is um, and, in and to learn management tools, um, thing, cause I would just freeze. My dog was lunging and barking and I'm just standing there holding the leash, like, oh my gosh. Um, but now to know, and, and someone ha else has said, have your head on a swivel, know what's around you and, and know where you can go to get that distance. Um, and uh, the trucks and stuff I have a hard time with because there's really, it, it's the noise, I think, mostly. Um, like, I just did a two-hour walk with him tonight, and right at the end, there was a Jeep that revved his engine to get us to move out of his way, and then a school bus that came up next to my car. I'm like, I can't, <laughs> there's nothing I can do. But I did learn um, the Take a Peek game from Laura. So I'm like, oh, I have treats. I have really high value treats. And I pulled him out. He looked, I treated, he looked at, he was eating feverishly, but he wasn't barking. So I, I just a management tool and tried to stop him from uh, practicing the behavior. Um, and going on the walks with you guys um, is great. Uh, having, uh, you know, someone out front letting me know there's a dog coming, it's on leash that at least, you know, calms me down um, and just get, have time to, to get that distance. Um, well, and Tracy, the, the walk that you mentioned with Laura, I just wanted to explain to people who are not familiar with our walks what that was. So that was an official club walk that we held in Manchester. 
and uh, the pond there uh, was Doors Pond. And Laura was running a loose leash recall training for our official club walk. And uh, Tracy had attended that with Echo, so she learned some valuable skill sets as well. And then we walked around the pond with Laura, who was helping uh, everybody with uh, what they had just learned. So, you know, our walks aren't just walks. They're, uh, you know, about connection. They're about education. They're about socialization. And so Tracy's explaining, you know, the, the things that she learned and how Echo and her benefited um, from what, you know, what Laura taught at that official club walk. Yeah, and to know that we're not alone. Uh, this was nothing I created. <laughs> it's, you know, something just changed. And I think it's confidence. Um, so I am, you know, looking for more situations to build confidence with him. The puppy parkour, I think, is great because, you know, just set him up on a rock. You know, he feels like he's accomplished something. And, you know, it's just something to think about other than, the scary thing that's coming at us. Um, well, I think what I found with you too, which I love because I know when you first started coming to our walks, you were really nervous. Uh, you yeah. were nervous about encountering uh, off leash dogs. Yes. You were nervous about uh, being in the front. You were nervous about being in the back. You were nervous about uh, an off leash dog carrying, uh, coming to you. And we talked about, you know, citronella spray and pepper spray and just uh, ways to feel more confident. And, you know, I think, you have attended more walks than any other reactive dog owner that I know. You're usually in the back because I know that you want to give Echo that space and just, you know, make sure he's comfortable. But I always see a huge smile on your face. Echo is always having a fantastic time. You know, I'm always circling back to check in on you to see if you need anything. But I'm just so glad that you continually push out of your comfort zone. Yeah. To join us, you know, on these outings that I know normally you wouldn't do on your own. I know there's a lot of comfort, um, obviously, in, in our groups going out yep. together. And there's a lot of trust. I really appreciate the trust that you've put in us. Yep. I have um, certain places that I found um, that I can go alone. I know there's because I'm familiar with them and I know I, and I'll I'll bike ride first. I'll take a ride on my bike just like somebody said they bring out their non-reactive dog first. Um, I'll go for a bike ride and I'll check it out. And then I know that that's some place I can go and just relax. I know that I only see like one other dog and it's a leashed area. So 99% of the time it's a, there, it's a leashed dog, but, um, having you guys there, I think the first walk I did with you was that, um, job mountain, Joe mountain. Oh yeah. Blue Job. Yep. I and we didn't know we did. It was not a leashed area. We didn't know what we were going to encounter. But having you guys up front and you would advocate for me and, um, you know, let them know that there's a reactive dog, leash up, let me know. Um, and then that one time at uh, that other pond we went to where that giant Great Pyrenees just came bounding up the trail. Oh, yeah. Cole Pond in Enfield. Uh, yeah. Yeah. At, it was the very end. And, and, and Ray just got right out there. <laughs> and grabbed the leash because the people had no recall. I had was no idea. Yeah. yeah, they shouldn't have been walking their dog the way they did. They needed no. a little education, so. But, you know, a lot of times there's, if there's no one else around, you know, it's it's really comforting and, and putting, you know, I, I just seeing the way that you guys handle um, other people and, and protecting us, <laughs> you know, keeping everybody safe. Well, and I appreciate you saying that because I've had many, many experiences walking my reactive dog alone with dogs off leash. So I know what people go through. I know the fears that they have. Um, you know, I, I took my two dogs walking to Pickering Ponds recently, which is one of my favorite places. It's not that well known. So the chances are pretty good that you're not going to find anybody there. And when I first got there, I was so excited. Nobody else was there. So we headed off. I had them both on a double leash. I get about halfway around the pond and I heard a, a gentleman behind me with a dog. Now, I didn't know if the dog was on leash, off leash, but I can tell you right at that moment, I was nervous as heck. And it wasn't that I was a single white female out here in a strange place walking yeah. by myself. It was like, oh my God, if they have a loose dog, there is no way that I can wrangle both my dogs because now Gilly will react because Dakota reacts and uh -huh. I have two reactive dogs. And I'm just, now I'm all worried. I can't enjoy the walk. I'm trying to hurry so I can get back to my car and I'm like, this is one of my favorite places and I can't even enjoy it. So 
I hear you when you guys say there's safety in numbers and it's much more yeah. enjoyable. And and the same. and you attract smart people. Yeah. That's the other thing. You you attract smart dog owners that know and you give a speech, you know, distance, you know, even just when I read your club rules, I'm like, this is just really smart. No nose to nose. You know, so many people just want their dog to sniff my dog. And I'm like, my dog doesn't want to sniff your dog. My dog will probably try to bite your dog. You know, my dog is not a dog sniffing dog anymore. We right. lost that when he came into puberty, when he, any dog he wanted to mount. So we lost that. But I think you just really attract really smart dog owners. And that also gives me comfort. Well, I appreciate you saying that because, yeah, you know, I feel that the people that come to these events are they're they're educated to a certain level, but they know, too, that they don't know it all and they want to learn more. They want to do better. They want to increase the relationship and trust and the bond with their dog and you know, by talking with other members who have been with us for a while, hearing their stories like we're sharing tonight, um, watching the different videos that we've created, the pop-up talks with the different experts. There's just so much education we try to give people. But really, it is it is that leap of faith, honestly, when it comes right down to it. I mean, you, Michelle, you both had to decide, okay, I'm going to attend an event. Just like Lisa, who, um, let's see. I just popped this up earlier. She's thinking Zoe and her should um, join for, uh, you know, a walk, maybe a weekday one to start. I know Lisa has a reactive dog as well. That's that's just it. You just have to take that leap of faith. Um, nobody's going to judge you. There's no reason why you should be embarrassed. Uh, worst case scenario, if it's not comfortable for your dog, if it's not comfortable for you, you turn around. I refund your money if you're not a member, if you, you know, paid to uh, come to that walk. Um, you know, we want everybody to feel welcome and safe and that this is, th this is, this is their people. This is their tribe. I mean, that's, that's really the environment that we're trying to create for everybody. So thank you very much for sharing your story, Tracy. I really appreciate it. And I know we'll see you and Echo at another event very, very soon because you guys are always coming and I appreciate your support. Was that Echo talking? Yep. He's been, does he have something to say? <laughs> Come here. Say hi. No, he was just playing, just okay. turning his toys, just like Willow, and all of a sudden, he probably has to poop now. He's a very <laughs> vocal pooper. <laughs> well, I'll let you go then, because that's important stuff. Thank you. Bye. Thanks for joining us, Tracy. Bye. Bye. And so now we have Lori Ann joining us. How are you, Lori Ann? So your microphone is, is muted. There we go. <laughs> Perfect. Welcome. Nice Thanks. to see you. <laughs> nice to see you. So Lori and I, Lori Ann and I know each other very well. She actually used to work with my company. It takes a village pet care. So we got to know each other on a different level as well. And then she actually joined the club and she introduced Obi to it. And now Obi is, he's a fun boy. And I want to actually just add it here into the, let's see, I've got a, lost my sharing here. Let me pop it back in. So Obi is not reactive in the way that you would think that he's reactive. Obi is just a giant love who has a lot of energy and is very vocal. And I, I have to point out this picture, Lorianne. I love this picture because <laughs> he best. is getting some serious air here. That's normal. <laughs> Actually, it's like you're flying a kite higher. instead of walking a dog. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> but why your story is so important, you know, even though Obi does not have the same reactive behavior, aggressiveness, need the same type of space as the other dogs, I know that you in the past have been worried about his vocal behavior because he is very loud. He yeah. gets very excited. He has a lot of energy. And you worry about how people will feel. I mean, this this picture of him here on the left at our Mexican Independence Day celebration. I know that you reached out to people and you were worried if people would not enjoy themselves because Obi would be making so much noise. And I really thought that that was a huge turning point in your relationship with Obi in his relationship with, you know, the people that come out for our uh, walks. Do you want to tell me a little bit about, you know, kind of what you were going through and the, uh, the nervousness, the frustration that you were feeling through that process? 
Yeah, I mean, I've we've come to several walks, as you know, and he's just so excitable. And he has this what they call submissive aggression behavior, uh, which means that he does things out of fun and excitement that kind of annoy other people, <laughs> uh, especially dogs. Like he'll lick them and lick them and lick them until they can't <laughs> stop. And, you know, they're like, leave me alone. And he's like, but I love you. Uh, so it's, it's really challenging for him because he just loves to be around dogs so much. He has to be part of a pack. And so when he feels he has some, um, you know, separation anxiety. So uh, when he feels like he's disconnected from his pack, he tends to kind of lose it a little bit. So he'll bark, 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 bark like crazy, as you have definitely heard him do. Um, and I was just, you know, when we were at our uh, apple picking event, I just noticed he was kind of on like a level 20 where normally he's like on a level 10. And I think it was from all the smells and all the excitement. And he just couldn't contain himself. And I had to kind of step back away from the group and kind of calm him down a bit and let everybody just move on. And I, I caught up a little bit later and I kind of felt like, you know, I don't want to ruin anyone else's experience. And I was frustrated, you know, but I was trying to like maintain my calm for him. And at the same time, I was like, I don't want to ruin anyone else's experience. And I don't know how they really feel about this, you know? So I just got a little bit of anxiety myself thinking, am I doing a good job? Am I annoying people? Is Obi really coming across as a pest more than a, a joyful love, uh, which is what I tend to think he is. So yep. I, I really wanted to just check with the, with the group and just say, you know, in all honesty, let's keep it honest. Like, is he ruining your experience? Because if he is, I can kind of take care of, you know, training him separately and then trying again later. And I just really wanted to make sure that people, you know, really did enjoy his presence and my presence and kind of having us as part of the group, because I never want anyone to not have a good experience because of our behavior. Um, and again, even though he is excitable and he's just a big love, he can be annoying. <laughs> so I just wanted to make sure, you know, that people understood he's just a happy dog. He's just probably one of the happiest dogs I've ever owned. And he's got so much excitement and so much love to give. And he doesn't know how to sit back and just enjoy the moment. He has to just like be in it like fully and completely. And so it's really hard to keep him back because he's like almost as tall as I am. Like you, yes, can, he's a big boy. <laughs> you can tell from the picture and the ice cream thing. He's like, can I order now? Like he's just, <laughs> he's <laughs> just a, exactly. He's just so, so interested and alert and in, in everything. He just, he, he has to be a part of everything. And so it would just really is, important to me that we're, you know, feeling welcome in the group and we've always felt welcome. I think I was just feeling a bit of anxiety in that moment. And I just wanted to allow myself to be, okay, I'm going to be comfortable, you know, going, knowing that everybody understands kind of what Obi and I are trying to figure out. It's a constant everyday learning experience to keep him at a calm level. Um, and we're still learning. We're trying so many things, you know, we're trying weighted jackets and we're trying, um, you know, some different collars and some different head harnesses. And I figured out that no matter what I put on, he's just, he's just going to be Obi. <laughs> that's true. Um, and I love that you said that. And I think that's really important that people have to allow the personality of their dogs to shine through and not be embarrassed and not be afraid. I mean, I, I love the fact that you reached out to the group because I think you needed validation as a member. Yeah. You needed to hear from your people. Yes. that they were loving and accepting of you and his wonderful personality. And, and obviously you got that because you came out that day and I know you guys had a great time. Yeah, it it really was at that moment really more about me than it was Obi because I just, I know Obi's going to be Obi no matter where we go. So I just need to make sure people feel comfortable with it. And I've always felt comfortable coming to walks um, and being a part of everything. Um, you know, I think my, my biggest thing about the, you know, the group is that, you really make relationships with specialists and behavioralists and all these experts in the field. And that's really uh, kind of what Obi and I need. You know, I know we have a great bond and I know that we're, you know, we're getting there and we're working on it. But the things that I'm learning from people, even just watching other people with their dogs and, you know, what I'm able to pick up on with his breed in particular from the specialists, it's just amazing. Like things I never thought of that seemed so easy, but I, I felt it might be too hard. So I just kind of steered away from it. And now I'm putting some of those things into practice going, okay, this makes a lot more sense now. Things are feeling a lot more comfortable and Obi's reacting better to what I'm saying and what I'm doing. So it's more of learning Obi and what his 
tells are and what his clicks are. Um, that really helps me, you know, to be able to feel comfortable. And the fact that the group is willing to share their knowledge, you know, share their support and always be so positive in the experience. It's, it's what really helps us and drives us to want to be part of this group. Well, I know too that you have involved Obi in a lot of different things that you hadn't tried before, right? So like dock diving. Yep. And yep. Uh, what are some of the other things that he's done um, other than walking that you've exposed him to? Um, he actually uh, has tried a little bit of agility. Um, he, uh, when we went to Concord, uh, we went to the fitness um, event during the Doggy Olympics. That was amazing because I thought there's no way my crazy, wild and excited dog is going to like center in and balance on a ball. <laughs> you know, like <laughs> I thought this is going to be interesting. Um, you know, he did have an issue with his paw at the time, but you would never know it. He was just it was amazing how he focused so much on the agility to the point uh, in the strength training that when we went across the balls the first time, he was really shaky and kind of floppy and all the balls went flying everywhere. <laughs> Uh, and then he wanted to get back up the second time and he was like, no, I can do this. And you could almost see in his mind, he changed and he was balancing more and he was kind of figuring it out. And so when we were all done and we're like, okay, it's time to go by. Obi was like, no, I'm not ready. And he jumped back on the platform and was like, I'm going to go again. And he, <laughs> he did it perfect all by himself. We weren't even there. He just jumped up and just ran across. And I was like, wow, like amazing. Um, so the things that he's been able to do, um, and even just last week, uh, we went to do, what was it called? The rat? What was that? The rat? Oh, the thing? sports sampler with Inspire Canines. Yeah. Yes. Oh my God. It was fantastic. He loved the tunnel, uh, the little tunnel thing. He almost knocked me over. I'm sure you guys probably saw that crazy video. Yep. Um, and he found that rat like nobody's business. He's a hound like through and through, and he did what he needed to do. And I think I just need to let Obi just embrace himself and let him figure out what he wants to do. Um, and so I think he's kind of chosen what he really likes and that's agility and hunting. <laughs> so. Well, and I think that's such a key point that you bring up because like children, we have to do the same thing. So why wouldn't we do that with our dogs? Do we yeah. feel more embarrassed if they don't fit into a perfect dog box of, or of some sort, you know, exactly. that's, that's what I go through with Dakota too. being reactive. It's just like, there's been so many bef before I started, it takes a village pet care. So many frustrating moments of me just not understanding uh, the dog world, dog behavior, her needs. Um, I was so frustrated. I, I would be in tears just trying to go on a walk in the woods because I could not for the life of me understand why was she still exhibiting this behavior? You know, it's shame on me for not doing what I needed to do to make sure that she had the best possible life because the, you know, I'm probably gonna get teary out here. <laughs> you know, she, she was reactive because of that experience she had at a dog park when she was younger. Yeah. And, you know, that set her up pretty much for a life of reactive behavior because I didn't know what I was doing. And I didn't know how to fix the mistakes that we had put in place. Yeah. Uh, hence the doggy socials that we now sponsor as an organization for our members uh, because of what I've learned from my mistakes. And I, I think most people will tell you, you know, they learn more from their mistakes than from their successes. And I can definitely say that with um, understanding my dogs. And, uh, you know, it's wonderful to hear everybody's stories about uh, how far you've come and how far your dog has come and your relationship has come. And I've seen that with my dogs, too. And it's just like, oh, my goodness. I, I guess I wish I had thought of this idea earlier or I could have found a supportive group like this when I needed it, you know, five, seven years ago for my dog. So. Yeah, I agree. I, I had a dog previously that was very reactive and this would have been amazing for him. Um, but instead he ended up just being separated from most and it was probably not the best life for him, even though he loved being with me. Um, it would have been better for him to have experiences that he's never had. So yeah, I, I for one appreciate this group like immensely. I don't know what I would have done. You know, the, the things that I've learned and the things I've been able to experience with him, I never would have done any of them. So um, very grateful. And thank you for welcoming us and letting us be a part of everything. Well, thanks, Lauren. And I really appreciate that. And you've been a, a founding member from day one. You've been so supportive of this community and, you know, uh, helping us to get where we want to go in the future. So thank you as well for that. And thank you for sharing your story tonight. You're very welcome.
and give Obi a kiss for us. I will. He's over here whining. He's like, okay. I hear you talking and I want to be it's part of it. It's my time now, Mom. <laughs> but that's just keeping him busy. <laughs> awesome. We'll take care, Lorian. Thanks right. again. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye. So now I have Allie here with me. How are you, Allie? Good. How are you? Good. And how's Miss Paige? She's doing good. She's got a very nice bandana on tonight. She always has some kind of different style going with her when I see her. I love it. <laughs> now she's sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much for joining me tonight and being willing to share your story because I think yours is even more unique probably than the others that we have heard tonight because you have worked so hard and dedicated so much time and understanding to Paige. And I, I'm anxious for you to tell everybody her story. Um, I, I mean, she is such a different dog today. You, you started... Uh, out in a very different um, place. Uh, and just tell me, set up the story. Like, how long has it been since you have had Paige? Yeah, so it's just been about a little under a year that I've had her. Um, so she came in as a foster in October. Um, so it's going to be um, kind of an anniversary coming up soon. Yeah, so that's Paige. And so tell us a little bit about what kind of reactive behavior she has. Yeah, so Paige um, was actually born feral um, to a feral mom. So she was in the um, <laughs> she was um, in the wild for months without any human contact. She was born to a feral mom. Um, her mom was severely abused, neglected. So she was um, completely scared of humans as well. And so she was raising her puppies, um, being so scared of humans and it took months for Mutt Madness to be able to catch this litter. Um, we finally caught them. Um, we actually started fostering her brother, Prentice, first. Um, so Prentice came up. He was really shy, um, kind of shut down, but he was able to blossom here. Um, it's in a wonderful home now. And then after he got adopted, uh, Miss Paige came up. Um, so um, I actually met her when we were volunteering at Mary's Dogs um, for like their quarantine period. And then when we went to go pick her up to bring her home as a foster, she would not put her leash on. She would not walk with us. She was completely shut down. She didn't even know what a leash was probably. Um, and she was scared of humans. Um, for her, humans are like, scary aliens they're germy um <laughs> yeah she's terrified of humans but she loves dogs because um, that's what she grew up with um and so we went to go pick her up and she would not come with us so we actually had to carry her out of mary's dogs in her crate and put in her put her crate in my car um and then we drove home and then probably for the first week we had to transport her in her crate from my bedroom to the family room to outside. Um, she was terrified. Um, she was kind of shut down. She found her little corner uh, in the family room as well, and she kind of stayed there for a few weeks. Um, even just getting her outside, we would have to go all the way out to the backyard into the back corner in the fence and not look at her, and then she would kind of sneak her way outside, go to the bathroom, come back in. Um, yeah, she didn't want any like interaction with us. She didn't like um, any eye contact and no, no touching at all either. So we spent many months just working on a relationship with her. Should we show her video that kind of shows what you've just kind of told yeah, us about? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, seeing is believing. You've made a great uh, video, and I'm hoping that our bandwidth holds up so that people can watch this, but let's see here, and hopefully people can hear the music as well. Let's see if I can get this going. I know for some reason we've been having a little bit of problem with the bandwidth, but let's see what happens here. All right, well, <laughs> well that's trying to figure it out. Okay, interesting. All right, well, well, we'll give it a minute here and see if it starts playing. But um, 
Yeah, this video brought tears to my eyes. It was very hard to watch the whole thing because she is really coming from a place of fear. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I don't have a lot of experience with feral dogs. Um, so, and I don't know what your background experience is, but you obviously dedicated yourself to this dog. And can you talk a little bit about that commitment? I mean, did you have to change your lifestyle? It was, was this, you know, what was your mindset in regards to giving a uh, page this attention and this dedication? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I bought all the feral books, all the shy dog books, all the podcasts. I listened to them all just to try to um, educate myself to be able to help her. Because at the time, too, we were I was not thinking about adopting her. I wanted her to be able to be successful, to be able to be adopted out um, to a loving family. And so that was my intention to begin with. Um, and so I spent months just trying to get her to walk on a leash. Um, and then, yeah, because she hated the hand coming up to her neck to try to clip the leash onto her collar. That was so scary for her. So we kept working on that. Um, we did a lot with like the touch cue. So for her to come up and touch my hand on her own um, and then a ton of positive <laughs> reinforcement with treats. Um, and then it took about, about three months to be able to walk her on a leash. And so um, we finally got her walking on a leash and then slowly been able to touch her a little bit more. She still gets kind of nervous um, being touched just by me too. But it was a little bit before Christmas and I realized like I couldn't give her up because she's going to stay with me. She's made so much progress um, considering just her sitting in the corner of the family room all day. Um, and now she's going on these walks and she has so many friends. Um, definitely her confidence has blossomed completely. Um, well, it's funny too how you're, you're saying, you know, that um, you decided to choose her after uh, you fostered her. Our, our animal communicator partner, Jody Crotty, would say that the dog picks the human. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's funny, but Paige needed you. She needed your patience. She needed your understanding. She needed your love. She needed your dedication, which you were able to give at that time um, mm -hmm. and are still able to give. And I, I mean, I can just see the two of you here now, uh, you know, after watching this video, which if I can't get it to go, I will post it in the group so people can see the before, because I know that you did post an after uh, video of... Um, her actually on the last uh, the senior walk that we did uh, last week and she's she's comfortable I mean yeah if people are behind her she gets a little bit nervous mm -hmm. you know she kind of checks her surroundings just to understand who's around but we've all come to understand and know and love Paige and we know the room that she needs we know not to approach her you know unless she tells us she's okay with that which I know it'll still take quite a bit of time um, she's gotten to meet new dog friends as you mentioned Bailey you know who comes with your mom loves uh, and gets along with Paige very well because they've spent a lot of time together. But I know she's met other friends as well. And what was interesting, too, is you were kind of on the fence about joining the club because I know you would come on walks with your mom and you would pay the fee. And then what was kind of the turning point that made you decide, OK, this is a worthwhile investment for me and I want to be a part of this? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we were I was also working um, with K9 Karma. Um, Eden for months um, in the spring and in the summer and then she was kind of telling me too, just to con continue with the walks because that's where she's getting a lot of her confidence from and so I was kind of hesitant at first especially at the first walk bringing her on because um, I was like thinking like everyone is going to have their perfect dogs because like Bailey is so social um, and so it's a little hesitant, but I brought her and I was so surprised on how she did. Um, I also think it's because all the people, they have a dog um, attached to them as well on a leash. So she sees them not as threatening. Um, so yeah, so she's kind of on like the different end of the spectrum for the other dogs. So she's nervous with, she's nervous with people, but she loves dogs. Um, and then for her fear, um, it's all internalized for her. So other dogs who are reactive, um, like they're barking, they're lunging, um, that's going on in her head. She's yeah. just not exhibiting it. 
she'll show like a lot of like body language cues and calming signals, um, but she's internalizing it also. She's she is definitely anxious and nervous, um, but it's just going on inside her head without outwardly showing it. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And you know what? I'm going to try one thing with the video here. I'm actually going to try to play it from my desktop and see if that makes a difference. So let me let me just switch over and see if that might work so we could show her story here. Let's see. All right, I've got the file. Let's try opening this here and see if it plays. Try to make it a little bit bigger. All right, here we go. How can you not watch that without crying? Oh my goodness. <laughs> Such a sweet story. Oh, that's just wonderful. I just love that, Allie. <laughs> and so now um, I, I just wanted to go to the Facebook group real quick because just trying to finagle all the stuff that I got going on here. Let's see. Because I know you posted a video today, I think it was. Let me just see mm -hmm. if I can pull it up here. I don't know if I'll have luck sharing it simply because of my bandwidth problem, but let's see if I might be able to show the after. The after one now. Let's see. So here's Paige walking in our senior walk last week. And this is how she's been. She comes out for special events. She comes out for group walks, small and big. Again, you know, that's how we are at these events. We're very supportive of the dogs that need extra space. Call them Dinos, dogs in need of extra space. We talk about the yellow ribbon project or the yellow 
uh, sign or bandanas that you see the dogs wearing. We explain to people who join us on walks for the first time or multiple times what that means. Um, it, and we also advocate for the owners. We want people who don't necessarily understand the Yellow Ribbon Project to know that you know these aren't owners who are uh, snobby or mean um, or just don't want to uh, engage with people. It's they're advocating for their dog and the needs that their dog have. And you know what we found is that by you coming out and sharing your story and giving Paige a chance and giving yourself a chance, Lori Ann doing it, Tracy doing it, Michelle doing it, Laura doing it, it's helping other people to make their way to our group and try with their dogs. Um, you know, baby steps. You might have to take a few steps back, but then you take a few steps forward. You find it for yourself. You gain the confidence. Your dog gains the confidence. Um, and I really think that's what you and Paige um, have accomplished over, you know, over the summer. I think, you know, the first event I think I met you at was Mount Agamenicus. Is that correct? Was that yeah, the we, first did, one we did the Epping one. Um, Burley's oh, Farm. yes. Burley's Farm. Yeah, that was the first That's one. right. That's right. And then you came to Mount Agamenicus, which was a very large group, actually. Um, and you've come to several of the special events. You've come to um, the pack adventures that happened during the week. Paige, we know that Paige loves to swim. You know, we know that she needs her space. We know that she loves Bailey. There's so much that we've learned about her and you. And, you know, we really appreciate you giving us the chance to get to know you and her on a very different level. Yeah, it's been amazing for her. Um, these vlogs, especially. Just seeing just her tail wag um, last week, it was like so heartwarming. Um, just seeing her so confident in herself and being able to like walk in front of me too. Such, yeah. such a big difference. Yeah, and you're so good at reading the signs. I mean, she's got the automatic signs tail between the legs, you know, uh, ears down, ears up, tail up. You know, we know because you've helped us learn what she needs in order to be happy and enjoy, you know, the settings that we provide. So um, that, that's, I mean, I'm just, <laughs> I had a couple tissue boxes going here when I was watching your videos <laughs> today. I'm like, okay, get it together. You've got to do this presentation tonight. <laughs> so Laura's got a comment here too. She says, uh, that was ad, uh, awesome, Allie. She is so lucky to have found you. Yeah, uh -uh. I think uh, we can all agree. Uh, with that with that case there and I know that we'll see her at many more events mm -hmm. and um, uh, my goal when she's ready when you're ready I would love to be able to touch her but in good time when mm -hmm. everybody's ready I mean that's my goal I have a shirt that says it you know my goal my life goal is to pat all the dogs so I can't die <laughs> without patting all the dogs so at some point I don't care how long it takes. She is a sweetie and she's come so far. So thank you so much for sharing your story, Allie. I really You're appreciate welcome. it. Very welcome. All right. Bye, Paige. Thanks for joining us, honey. Bye-bye. We'll see you at the next walk. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks, everybody, for joining us tonight. I've got just a couple other things that I'm going to show you. Um, I'm going to go through some of the comments and questions, too, and just see if there's any that we didn't uh, answer. Also, if you have any comments or questions uh, you want to pass my way now as we're finishing up about uh, either membership or about your specific situation, please feel free. One of the slides that I want to show you here, just because there's been many questions about it. Let's see if I can throw it up here. Um, in regards to where we have our walk. So what I did is I created a pinpoint map of where our members are currently located, uh, our official club members, not our community, and where we have hosted our events just this year. So you can see on the left here, uh, the, all those little pins will show you where our members are located. We've got uh, people to the west side of Concord, just a few. The highest concentration is in Stratford in Rockingham County. We've got a few people in Maine, uh, a few people closer to the Lakes region, and then we have a lot of people down uh, Manchester, Derry, Nashua, Hooksit area. And then on the right, again, this is just for 2021, the events that we've hosted this year. You can see there's a large uh, concentration of events in the Rockingham, Stratford County. We've had a few in Maine, um, and we've done some down that 93 corridor. 
But you can see over here, there is a little bit of a missing area where it doesn't coincide with where we have members. So I just want to let you know, we are very conscious about where our official club members are located and making sure that we have ample walks in those areas. And that is how we schedule our events. So you may be a member of our community and you may be saying, you know, I'd love to attend a walk, but you don't have any events in our area. Um, you know, we love to have you as part of our community, but obviously we are still growing. We, we only launched our founding membership in March. We, uh, have, we are currently training some event guides and our goal is to spread out and offer events uh, in different parts of New Hampshire and eventually be in all of New Hampshire. But uh, it's going to take a while, especially with staffing issues. That's the biggest thing that we're seeing now is just finding um, the people to, uh, that are right for um, uh, our club. So uh, it will take a little bit of time there, but we are dedicated to uh, having fun activities and events in the areas where our members are. So you can see that my goal here by the end of 2021 is to make sure that the map on the right is very similar to the map on the left. So if you are a member, we are dedicated to making sure that there are going to be events happening in your area. So I just thought I'd put that together to let you know. Um, we've actually had quite a few more people join from the uh, main area, and we have uh, a few members from Massachusetts. And it, it always surprises me, too. We have a lot of members that travel, or I should say a lot of members in our community uh, that travel up for our different events. We had an event, I believe it was two weekends ago at Flag Hill Winery. It was our first Wine and Wags. And uh, we had 19 people who had registered, but we actually had 37 people who showed up. That actually caught us off guard and we were not prepared for that many people because we'd only made a reservation for 20. So we have actually gone ahead and changed our whole registration system. Everything now happens through our website and everything is either RSVP driven or um, you have to register and pay in advance. Now, if you are a member of the club, there are several of the walks that you get for free. Um, or that come with your membership, which is the official club walks, the pop-up walks, uh, the doggy socials without an expert, and our pack adventures. And our pop-up walks are very um, robust. So they include hikes and hops, wine and wags. We're going to be starting a new one called uh, Mutts and Mead, um, and all of the other different types of uh, walks that make up the bulk of what we do are actually the, um, the pop-up walks. So um, uh, where was I going with that? I totally lost my train of thought. Oh, well, it'll come back to me. It's late. <laughs> so anyways, uh, oh, okay. So those, uh, as a member, those are the uh, outings that are included in your membership. We have special events as well. Um, the, the next one we have coming up is, is the Sweet Trail and Tasting this Saturday. Other special events, we've done our uh, doggy Easter egg hunt. We have our corn maze and Halloween party coming up. Um, we did a Mother's Day, Father's Day combo. Um, we did something for July 4th. So we usually have about one special event a month. And as a member of the official club member that you get discounted rates on those events. And the other events are uh, included with your membership. So just to mention that there as well. And so I want to go through a few comments here. I'm just going to take the screen sharing off. And I just want to go back up because there's a lot of great things that people were sharing. So uh, Lisa was sharing her dog, Zoe, age three, has been reactive since she was attacked at a dog park. OK, so same thing as my Dakota, completely unprovoked as well. When she was one and a half years old, I've done a lot of professional and personal training with her since and she's made a lot of progress, but it's hard to tell how much progress. I feel like I need to introduce her to more dogs, dog encounters. And Lisa, I know you and I have talked before and I would love to have you come out and try with Zoe and just see. Um, feel free to come to one of our smaller events. Feel free to come to one of the events that is uh, attended by a trainer. Um, you know, and we're always looking for what other types of events we should put together that better support our members' needs. So um, if there is, this is something I'd probably be working with Laura Gendron on because I know she has a great training program with field trip training outings, kind of like what we do, but specific uh, training handholding that happens there. So I know her and I could put our heads together and come up with some ideas too, to better support our members and uh, their reactive dogs needs. So thank you for sharing that story. 
Uh, Michelle says, Lisa, Laura has a great idea of just showing up to a walk and sit back and see how she does. You can almost go home if it's too much for her. If she's okay, you just hang back and let her be in a larger space with others. Exactly. And that's great, Michelle, because um, that's what a lot of people do. I mean, Tracy and Echo are usually in the back and they're having a great time. Um, there's no reason why you shouldn't feel comfortable there. You are not going to be judged. You are not going to be shunned. You are not going to be asked to leave. That is not the type of uh, organization that we run. Uh, we are welcoming, we are inclusive, uh, and we want to create a positive, safe environment. And if for some reason you attend one of our walks and you see something to uh, that is not what I just said, then I would want to know about it so that we could make changes to make sure it is the best environment for everybody. So Jamie says, I want to basket muzzle train Cody, but I tried several different sizes and they seemed either too tight or too loose and pushing on his eyes. Any suggestions? I tried three sizes of them on him at PSP. So Jamie is also one of our members. And Jamie, as I mentioned with Laura too, I don't know if you heard this, but we do have curriculum coming that Laura and I are working on together for the PAUSE uh, curriculum, which is our dog training success path that is rolling out at the end of this year for official club members only. So there's going to be um, lots and lots of good resources there to support you uh, as well. Lisa says, thank you, Laura. Laura, I would guess he's a size four. Okay, so this is answering your question, Jamie, which you've probably already seen. Probably a size four basketball, but you can also mold them to make them wider if needed. I will send you some resources. Thank you, Laura. That's fantastic. Appreciate you helping Jamie out there. Uh, Angie says, this is such great information. Thank you for sharing. And uh, Angie is a recent uh, new member of our official club. Um, Laura Gendron actually referred her. Angie has a reactive dog as well and she will be trying out our walk. So we look forward to meeting you, Angie, uh, at an event when it is uh, convenient for you. Uh, Jamie says, Michelle, I think even despite his smaller outburst at Laura's Olympic game night, he did great. You guys make a great team. I have to echo that as well. Uh, Michelle, you've done wonderful things with Brutus. He's an amazing dog, um, and he is because of the love and support and dedication that you have given him, so kudos. Uh, Brutus has a great, loving, committed mommy. Yes, he does. Let's see here. Um, Allison says, you brave moms are making me feel more confident to bring my reactive girl. We love Mama Lulu. Know that she is a wonderful dog, and we would love to meet your reactive dogs as well. I know that you also have one or two. I can't remember. I know you have a total of three dogs. I'm not sure how many are reactive. Um, but yeah, you know, try it, Allison, um, come experience it. Like, you know, everybody else has and just see, uh, if it is a good environment for your dogs. Let's see. Let's see. Nancy, who is also a, an official club member, will there be another walk with Laura soon? So usually we, uh, rotate through our featured, uh, experts, uh, through the year. Um, it just really depends on our, our trainer's availability. Laura has been, uh, dedicating a lot of time to the different things we've done from um, the Doggy Olympics, from being a featured expert to pop-up walks, to supporting us in um, periphery type things like this, to being involved with some of our, our other special events. But um, yeah, she we have a lot of people that uh, request her. So anytime Laura's available, I'm ready. Um, I just know that the, the training industry right now is so, so hectic. Um, and we, we do slow down a little bit in the winter just because we do go into planning mode for 2022. Um, but we because we have so many uh, inside venues this year as well, like the mall, um, which I've been receiving several requests from people to hold another event there. Um, we had a very successful one with Monica uh, earlier this year on a rainy day. It was a, a sensory experience and it was wonderful. We got so much great feedback. We will be doing more with them and other places that I've identified. Um, April in Concord at K9 Fitness has a great setup. Um, and there's other places that I will uh, be uh, pulling out of my sleeve for you guys as we get into the colder weather. Lisa says, there's so much psychology associated with reactive dogs. It's so great to have professionals like you and your group to help. Yeah, thank you for that, Lisa. Um, I, I, you know, granted um, dog training, that that is above my pay grade. That is why I have the experts uh, that I consult with, the veterinarians that I consult with, amazing, amazing people who are very, very experienced, and I rely on them uh, for that type of information. But um, yeah, I, I'm the person, my strength is bringing people together 
It's uh, uh, opening avenues for communication, uh, you know, with our members at events, um, you know, uh, asking, you know, when when Laura was at the walk with Willow with the basket muzzle, we had some new people there who hadn't met Laura before. They might have seen Willow and thought, oh, my goodness, what kind of walk, what kind of group is this that they allow dogs, you know, aggressive dogs? You know, she might not have known. We need to uh, educate people and we need to open up the opportunity for people to communicate. It's just so important to have this platform for people to be able to ask Laura and say, why does your dog wear a muzzle? Is your dog aggressive? Can I not pat your dog? What does this mean? This is so important for for that communication to exist in our community and at our events and between our members. Uh, Lisa says it can be uh, definitely be stressful for the reactive dog owner. You're absolutely right. Uh, let's see. Um, so good for Bergy and Izzy. That's coming from Sarah Batterson. Yes, thank you very much. You and your mom, who are also members, we appreciate your support. Uh, let's see. Michelle says another perk. The members are awesome too. Yeah, they're very damn awesome. I uh, have to agree with that. Uh, let's see, Michelle, I never thought of Obi as reactive. He's just a happy, excited boy. He absolutely is. But that is a form of reactive behavior because he is reacting to stimuli around. It's just his reactive behavior is very different than what we see with some of the other dogs. Yes, hello, I'm almost done. Can you wait a few minutes? You already had your food. at cinnamon. <laughs> All right, let's just see. We'll finish up here. Um, let's see what else we've got here. And Michelle, just making sure I've got all our questions here. Thank you guys for all these comments and everything. These are wonderful. The, the support, the love, the feedback. I just love this. Um, this is amazing. Uh, and yeah, I mean, you did hear some stories tonight of dogs that were rescued from Mary's Dogs. Uh, we love Mary's Dogs. They are one of our charitable partners. They are also a corporate partner. Um, and we appreciate everything that they do for the dogs that they rescue and also to help educate people. Uh, Adam says, my best friend is such a big part of this. Julia D'Souza, Pups and Pints tomorrow. Yep, great event to support uh, Mary's Dogs. Uh, one of our other charitable partners will be there as well, Cheryl from uh, Pet Wants. So go out and uh, rescue some dogs, adopt some dogs, learn about Mary's Dogs and uh, support our charitable bowl and our export partners as well. All right, so... Allison says, Buddy is a lot like Paige. He's coming Saturday, so just pretend he's invisible. <laughs> too funny. That See, that'll be a great walk, too, because we'll be able to spread out uh, at the Sweet Trail. Um, it's a longer walk. The docks will uh, definitely be uh, enriched, and they will be exhausted. And then they get to go and do a taste testing with Sweet and Memories Bakery, which is going to be fabulous. So I'm really looking forward to that event. Uh, Angie says, ha ha, Cece just went flying looking for your cappy now. <laughs> uh, let's see what we've got. Speaking of reactive dogs, both my pups just woke up when they heard your cat. <laughs> so reacting to cats, that's another form of reactive behavior. So, all right, guys. So thanks so much for all of those qu great questions and comments. So just lastly, um, Again, we are uh, open membership period right now. Uh, we open the club four times a year on the solstice and the equinox, and we are open for 10 days on each of those times. So right now we opened on September 20th. We are closing doors on September 30th. So if you are interested, head on over to NewHampshireDogWalkingClub.com, and uh, you can learn all about what we do. Uh, either, there's even more that we offer than what was mentioned tonight. You heard all the fantastic stories from some of our members. Um, there are more stories and more testimonials on that page that you can learn about. Um, and if you choose to join the club, um, please uh, we welcome you with open arms. And uh, you just need to do so by 11.59 p.m. on the 30th. Otherwise, doors will close again and open on December 20th. And each time we actually close and reopen, it is at a higher price point, just because there's more education and more resources that have been put out there and we're doing things a little differently just based on everything that we learn and the new partners that we add uh, to the organization. So I believe between when we opened last time in June and this time there was a an $8 increase, I believe, um, in the membership. So obviously uh, joining and locking in that rate secures that rate for the future for you. 
And of course, obviously, if joining the club is not right for you, you are still completely welcome to join any of our events. It's just at a higher cost, obviously. And as the club grows and we have um, events, as I mentioned, that we only sell a certain number of tickets, like the Easter egg hunt, the upcoming uh, corn maze and Halloween party, those tickets do go on sale to members first. So if all tickets sell out to our members, then there would not be anything available to the community. So that is another way uh, or another benefit of making sure you are able to get in on these fun and unique events that we uh, offer. And um, if you have been with us since the beginning of the year, um, you have been able to participate in some of those really fun and unique events. And the corn maze and Halloween party coming up on the 24th will be no exception. And tickets do go on sale tomorrow for uh, members. And we're going to be selling somewhere between 30 and 40. It's really going to depend because if we have four people buy tickets and only one dog, then, you know, that allows us to have more tickets. It's really the number of dogs um, and the close proximity of the area that we're going to that we just try to monitor again so that everybody feels safe and comfortable and welcoming, welcomed in this environment. So again, thank you very much, everybody. I appreciate you listening. I'd love to have you join the club. Um, the support you give us now allows us to do more programs and provide more education in the future as we go forward. When we roll out the pause curriculum at the end of the year, it really will be a game changer. It is a, a, a curriculum, a, a dog training success path that I have been working on since the beginning of the year with not only our training partners, but other uh, dog trainers and uh, canine fitness experts uh, and other professionals throughout the state of New Hampshire. And there's nothing like it that has um, been accomplished or tried or offered that I know of or that our partners know of. So um, I'm really excited to be doing this collaboration with them and be bringing you this curriculum that's going to be rolling out at, at the end of the year. So even though it's not out now, when you uh, get your membership, you're securing that uh, that six month rate or that annual rate for you. And once this curriculum uh, rolls out, I do anticipate that membership on an annual level will be close to 300, just because uh, 300 a year, just because of the the amount of information and education and resources that uh, you know the dog, the New Hampshire Dog Walking Club and our partners have put together for you, um, it's going to be very very beneficial. That is our hope. Um, that is what we are trying very hard to put together for you. This good quality uh, content. All right. So thank you for staying with me this long. We had a great crowd tonight. I really appreciate it, guys. Um, I'm going to sign off now. If you have any questions uh, between now and the 30th when the club closes, feel free to tag me, um, tag any of the partners. Um, if you have questions, Laura Gendron, who was kind enough to take time out tonight to talk with us as well, feel free to tag her if you have any questions about her experience as well with Willow and the club. And um, love to welcome some new members uh, after the 30th. So thanks again, guys. Have a fantastic night and hope to see you at the next event.